We're days away from the U.S. election, something that the whole world is talking about. So I'm going to highlight for you the past two, three weeks in news, the good, the bad, the ugly, and compare it to the scriptures. It seems like we have a crisis of information. We have a crisis of truth. Let me read to you this funny meme. We live in a world that's made up of fake people, fake food, fake medicine, fake weather, fake news, fake history, fake pandemics, fake revolution, fake spirituality. I wonder why people hate the truth. You know, Jesus said, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. So, of course, the devil is going to try to distort and twist the truth. And we live in a time where people are really passive consumers of information. They're not producers of information. So I've often wondered why people don't care as much as I do about big tech censorship and about the outrageous lies that are being told right now. And, you know, we have to put the blame, first of all, before we even talk about what's going on secularly. We have to put the blame on the church. An alarming 52% of evangelical churchgoers reject absolute moral truth. So let's talk about the state of the church. This is from ChristianHeadlines.com, released in October 7. A poll by the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University examined the views of attendees of evangelical, Pentecostal, mainline Protestant, and Catholic churches on 51 beliefs and behaviors. Among the findings, the survey discovered that a major a majority of evangelicals, 52%, 69% of Pentecostals, 58% of mainline Protestants, and 69% of Catholics say there is no absolute moral truth that applies to everyone all the time. On the question of sin, a large majority of evangelicals, 75%, 76% of Pentecostals, 81% of mainline Protestants, and 84% of Catholics disagree with the statement People are not basically good. We are sinners. Of course, that's the foundation of why Jesus came. He came to save sinners. If we're not sinners, he didn't come to save us. So the report authors concluded, American Christianity is rapidly conforming to the values of the post-Christian secular culture. The survey also found that among evangelical churchgoers, 43% believe Jesus sinned. Hey, wait, let me say that again. 43% of so-called evangelical churchgoers, okay, they go to church, but they're not Christian because they believe Jesus sinned. The Bible is very clear that Jesus is sinless. He's the only sinless person to have ever lived. That's why he can qualify to be our Savior. 43% do not believe that there is a common God-given purpose to humanity. Okay, so they're drifting through life. They're living a purposeless life and they don't believe they need to be saved. 42% seek moral guidance primarily from sources other than the Bible. This is a total rejection of you know, the Apostles' Creed, the basic tenets of our faith. A news release from the Cultural Research Center called the results alarming. For evangelicalism. You know what? It's not alarming just for evangelicalism. It's alarming for the future of America and it points to an information crisis. In the age of information, because people have no longer have the love of the truth and they're becoming passive consumers rather than actively thinking and engaging with the information that's coming to them, we are losing our hold on the truth. And so people are going to become slaves. When you don't believe the truth, you become a slave. When you believe the truth, you become set free. The CRC said, What makes that trend so significant is that evangelical churches, by definition, teach that the Bible is the authoritative word of God that teaches not only salvation by grace alone, but also an array of life principles that are meant to drive one's thoughts and actions. Well, I would say that the answer is right there. Because they teach an imbalance of hyper-grace, what is the responsibility to live a holy, righteous life, seeking and pursuing truth? I'm not saying live a pharisaical life or a legalistic life, but there is a balance to grace. There is grace on the one hand, there's truth and justice on the other hand. Truth and justice are on the other hand. Grace, righteousness, and mercy, they're on the other side. There has to be a balance in the teaching of the body of Christ. 
So now we come to the crisis of information when it comes to this presidential election. This is not a contest between two personalities. Maybe at other elections it could have been, but not in this one. This one is not about two personalities. It's not even about two policies or sets of policies, two different political platforms. No, it's about two different ways of life, two different ways that we're going to live. Are we going to live under total tyranny, control, Marxism, socialism on the left side? Or are we going to live under freedom, freedom of information, freedom to trade and, and do commerce as we choose, freedom to practice our religion, freedom in every area of life as long as we're not encroaching on other people's lives and property? That's on the right side. Right, the pattern of disinformation from the communist left is pretty clear now. You can see how it works. Here's a woman who's a highly qualified for the Supreme Court. She has a track record. She's a family woman. She has seven children. And during the Senate confirmation hearing, Cory Booker asked her, are you a white supremacist? In effect, he said, do you disavow white supremacy? And this is an astounding question to be asking someone who's adopted two black children from Haiti. I mean, what does it take to not be a white supremacist? Are you supposed to not adopt them? Or are you supposed to adopt three or four? It's not even worth answering such a question. The media has said for three and a half years, has accused Donald Trump of being anti-Semitic, of being Nazi. Now, can you imagine this? A Nazi is by definition an anti-Semite. Now, Trump has a daughter who married a Jew. Trump has a son-in-law who is a Jew. Trump has grandchildren who are Jewish children. How do you even accuse him of that? Then they say that, well, he's a racist. I know a lot of my friends in Australia and Asia, they don't get the full news and they believe this stuff. Well, how is it that a racist is supported, is endorsed by so many black people, especially someone like Herschel Walker, who worked in football with him for the past three decades? Walker said the left's hypocrisy on race is being exposed. And now you've got breaking news. 50 Cent, a rapper, says, I endorse Trump. Why? Because I don't want to be 20 Cent under the Biden tax plan. See, what is good for minorities that have been disadvantaged? Not more taxes, not more government handouts and living under a nanny state, which sabotages their future. You need to give people the opportunity. The communist left has been doing this. I'll read you this meme. We got the election wrong. We got the economy wrong. We got North Korea wrong. We got collusion wrong. But our liberal viewers still trust us. And the only way to explain that is that left-wing ideology is a religious faith. And I use this now in a pejorative because I don't use faith that way. I don't believe faith is blind, but they like to make fun of religion and say religion is blind. Well, then they'd fit that definition perfectly, don't they? And just to illustrate to you how controlling social media has become, when you click on this photo, this is the message you get. Notice, this photo is no longer available. I'm going to give you example after example. And I hope that some of those who really sit on the fence and don't care realize one day this is going to come home. This is going to hit you if you don't vote for freedom. The collusion, the collaborative network to lie and disseminate misinformation is so great that during the Amy Barrett hearing, because the word preference came up in connection to transgender ideology, Merriam-Webster Dictionary actually changed the definition of preference. So preference is now, look at definition five, offensive. So the term sexual preference is offensive because they want to push this unscientific idea that you cannot choose your sexual orientation. Well, that's interesting because they were saying all this time that you can choose any of 50 odd gender identities and you can choose to change your birth certificate. But if you say you have sexual preference, oh no, that's offensive. And you know, if they're in power, they would criminalize it, they'd make it illegal. They are trying to control people through controlling language. The biggest news right now is how any evidence that is anti-Biden or pro-Trump is censored. Now, if you don't know, the New York Post was actually founded by one of the 
Founding Fathers, the Federalist Alexander Hamilton in 1801. It was bought by Rupert Murdoch, who's an Australian that's went over to succeed and live in America. Uh, it was bought over in 1976 for 30 odd million dollars. So the New York Post is one of the longest standing, well-established sources of news. It's been around from the founding of the nation. And, and it still has one of the biggest circulations of any newspaper. And Facebook and Twitter blocked a New York Post expose on Hunter Biden files. We no longer have freedom of the press. The issue of this election is no longer just about personalities. It's about the freedom to get information, to get to truth. And I say this, look, if you don't love the truth, it's not just your problem, it's everybody's problem. Because if we don't believe in truth, then we can no longer debate, we can no longer discuss, we can no longer compromise, we can no longer work together. When people say, let's come together, let's work together, that means that there has to be a truth that we're moving towards. It cannot just be my truth, your truth. And the reason that there's no compromise right now is because people say that. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you're running the 100 meter dash and we agree that there is a finishing line. All right, the line is here. That's the standard. When you cross that line, you win. Okay, now if we agree on that truth, if we disagree, who won because it was such a close race? All we have to do is get a referee or today we can get a camera and just go frame by frame and look, check it out. Whose nose, whose chest touched the finishing line by a microsecond first? You see, then we can begin to work with each other. If we have a disagreement, we say, well, let's go back to the standard of truth that we believe in. There's a finishing line. But if you say, hey, no, you have your finishing line and I have my finishing line. And so I won because I moved my finishing line. Well, we have no fair race. We have no fun either. We have no reward that's worthy to talk about, right? All of life becomes disjointed, chaotic, and people really fall into disagreement when you attack the very precept, the very idea, the very premise of truth. So this thankfully got a lot of coverage, right? October 14, Brent Bozell says New York Post's Hunter Biden story censored by Facebook, Twitter, big tech votes for Biden. That's exactly what it means. They're doing everything they can to ensure that their candidate wins. They're not presenting truth to you. They're not trying to tell you objective news. Senator Howley demands answers from Facebook for, quote, censoring a news report on Hunter Biden. Former Vice President Joe Biden, at his son's request, reportedly met with one of these foreign operatives who wanted to pay for influence. And uh, his name is Vadim Porcharsky, and Biden met with him in April 2015 in Washington, D.C., according to this. Even though social media blocked the New York Post story, the Republican House Judiciary posted the banned article. And Twitter blocked that link as well. So it was a link to the government website. Here's what the Judiciary GOP said. Twitter has blocked users from tweeting the link to the New York Post story on Hunter Biden. So we put it on a website for you to read and share. Now, the level of censorship is off the chart. I said that when we get to the 2020 election, it's going to start getting crazy. Well, look at this. They even dared to censor the Twitter account of the White House press secretary, Kaylee McEnany. Here's what she posted. This is Twitter telling her. We have determined that this account violated Twitter rules. Well, which one is it? Violating our rules against distribution of hacked material. We don't permit the use of our services to directly distribute content obtained through hacking. Wait a second. If the information was obtained by hacking, wouldn't that mean that it's true? Wouldn't that mean that it was actually Hunter Biden's laptop and Hunter Biden's emails? So Kaylee tweeted this out, email from Ukrainian executive to Hunter Biden asks, asks Hunter to use his influence on behalf of the firm, paying him $50,000 a month in email with subject, urgent issue obtained by the New York Post. His father, Joe Biden, was in charge of Ukraine relations at the time. That's abusing your position. Again, if this is 
a policy that they stand by, it only means that Hunter Biden's material is true. But the fact is, the material was not obtained by hacking. It was just on a laptop that Hunter Biden forgot at a computer repair shop. And after so many months, it becomes their property. You know, they have a right to wipe it out and resell it and all that. So Trump calls this the laptop from hell. It really contains some damning information, according to people who've seen it. But let's just go with Twitter's story. Let's say that this is their policy. Well, then how come they don't follow it when people release unsubstantiated, undocumented, unverified information that is anti-Trump, that tries to hurt the Trump campaign? So here, a tweet says, In 2018, a series of damaging stories about longtime Republican or GOP donor Elliot Broidy appeared in the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. The stories were largely based on emails, most likely hacked by Qatari intelligence. Based on Twitter's very broad policy, shouldn't those stories be blocked? Well, to today, they're not blocked. Anything that's anti-Trump is not blocked. Alex Thompson said, wow, Twitter going even further than Facebook and is no longer letting people tweet the New York Post story. This is what pops up if you try. Tweet not sent. How many ways can social media take away the freedom of speech? Now Twitter is nuking retweets until after the election. So not only are they suppressing stories that might hurt their candidate and help Trump, they're not going to allow you to retweet the stories that are not suppressed. So Donald Trump Jr. tweeted this out from David Steinberg. This should disturb every American. Twitter has placed a headline warning label on this Wall Street Journal article about the inspiring Kim Baltimore. The headline on the Wall Street Journal article was a Black Lives Matter Republican. Okay, a Black Lives Matter Republican. What did Twitter say? Twitter says headlines don't tell the full story. So they want to correct the story. They are basically saying that they will censor black people if they're not Democrats. Wow. That's so demeaning, so degrading, and really so racist. Social media's message to us is you must have approved thinking. So they're exercising the power of a thought police. I'll give you another example. This is a recent tweet from my account. In 1257, Marco Polo arrived at Xanadu, the great city of Kublai Khan, who ruled more than one-fourth of the earth. Today, this part of Inner Mongolia is mostly deserted and empty plains. Khan could have signed the Paris Climate Accord, and it would have made no difference. The climate changes anyway. You know what Twitter did? They have this triple-check account, and this must be automated by AI, because immediately... And they've done this to me a few times. They gave me a warning label. You see this? Why did I get this bot alert? Just a second. You might have shared information amplified by a network of automated accounts. I don't know anything about that. They might seem harmless like normal accounts, but they share inaccurate information to divide people. Okay, so now they're calling my information, my tweet, inaccurate and divisive. Click the link to learn more. What right do they have to determine what is true? I just gave them facts. It's the same as Greenland used to be green, and now it's got ice. Climate changes had nothing to do with carbon emission or human activity. In the same way, there used to be a great lake in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Today, it's all dried up. In the same way, Inner Mongolia used to be the center of the world's largest empire. It stretched from present-day North Korea and China all the way to Turkey. That's phenomenal. That's amazing. So there's nothing inaccurate about what I said. But you see, it doesn't matter today if it's true because social media says we decide what's true for you. And if people continue to be passive consumers of technology, their ability to filter out approved thought, state-sponsored thinking, social media propaganda, your ability to reason is going to be weakened. Here are the facts. Around the time that Marco Polo traveled to China, there was what was called a medieval warm period. And you can see this cycle. It's going up and down, up and down. But the cycle is narrowing, which shows what? Take a look at it. From ancient Egyptian time to the modern climate mania time, 
there's actually a downtrend. The cycle is always going to be there. Climate's always going to change. There's going to be global warming and global cooling. And it's been happening at a higher rate of difference, greater variation in temperature in the past than now. So why are we panicking now? So this Dr. Wheeler predicted that the modern warm period would actually end in 2000. Well, guess what? They used to say the world's going to end from global warming, the ice cap's going to melt, and that hasn't been happening because we're going into cooling periods. So they say, oh, no, it's a climate change. Well, that's a meaningless term, isn't it? Because the climate's always been changing. And I stated a very plain fact that around this time, something happened to the territory, to the land of the Mongolian Empire. Until today, it's not recovered. It started declining in temperature, and so the land no longer produced as much crop. You know, they used to have to store hundreds of thousands of kilograms of grain to be able to feed people. And all that grain came from rich agriculture, and agriculture booms during warm periods. In fact, global warming is a good thing for plants. If you love plants and you love agriculture, warming is good. But they went into a cooling period without any interference from human activity. This is influenced by the sun. And so the Mongolian Empire is no longer there. That's one of the reasons. So look, what can be done about this? Well, breaking news today is that the Justice Department is hitting Google with an antitrust lawsuit. And of course, this is long overdue. This should have been done well within the first term of Donald Trump. But his campaign is now in jeopardy. Even though I still believe he's going to win, it really is at a knife's edge because these people have power. These big tech companies have more money and more power to control you and control information and to shape thoughts. Kids' opinions are being spoon-fed to them. Big tech is able to assign opinions to your children and they wouldn't even know that they're being assigned. You watch the documentary called Social Dilemma and you see that kids' behavior and thoughts are being programmed by these big tech companies. So it's time to do something about it. Now, I don't think it's enough. Look, I predicted that this was coming since I published Trump's Unfinished Business, 10 Prophecies to Save America. And I not only said that this was coming, I also said that it would be inadequate. Quote on page 64, I offered a template to move forward with digital rights. We cannot rely on old business assumptions. Pundits have wrongly compared Google to Standard Oil and AT&T, both of which were able to be broken up by antitrust legislation. Some have proposed separating Google search engine from its parent company Alphabet or separating YouTube from Google, but these solutions miss the point. On page 65, I said, rather than breaking up the tech giants, I suggest the following to the president and to Congress. And I named seven things. So let's just do a couple of them. One, enshrine data rights. Give people back control over their personal data. Two, give people freedom to migrate out of any social media, just like you can change phone companies or utility providers. Let me explain that. I go on in page 66 and say this. The first step should be to order tech giants to comply with internet standards. For instance, and this is the part that people seem to miss when they talk about breaking up these social media companies, the AC electric power grid is standardized. This allows for competition among electricity providers. The landline telephone network is standardized, so we can have large competition. SMS is standardized. The internet is standardized with protocols such as HTML. Protocols are the communication languages of the servers and clients. Big tech, by contrast, refuses to operate by standard protocols. The solution is simple. No new standards need to be written. They're already written by the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, the committee that standardizes Internet protocols. Big tech ignores these standards to create their monopolies and, by extension, their censorship. This, rather than their mere size, is the crux of the problem. I suggest a three-step plan to the president and to Congress. All right, so that's contained in Trump's unfinished business. Every chapter deals with another major freedom issue, major policy issue, a major agenda on God's plan. Why should Trump be reelected? Because God has 10 major reformation agendas that are based on his word. They're contained in that book. And we're about to release this book in 
Chinese, German, Indonesian, and Thai. It's phenomenal. God's really blessed this book. God's brought people from all over the world asking for permission. Can we please have this book in our language? 